Welcome to the answers explained to part B-2 of the August 2022 Regents exam. Grab yourself a pen, a piece of paper, reference tables, and a calculator, and let's get started. Part B-2 starts with question 51. The first 50 questions are multiple choice questions, part A and part B-1. Check out my other videos on those sections if you didn't do them already. Here we're looking at short answers to questions. Uh, also part C will be coming up after part B-2. Again, short answer questions. Now, in order to get a passing grade on a Regents exam, typically you have to get, um, let's see, it is 50 points out of 85 possible points. 50 multiple choice questions, if you get them perfect, of course, then you'd be going into this part already having a passing grade, but now you want to do better. A lot of times students are on the borderline. They're not going to get 50 questions right. That means part B-2 and part C are as important as the multiple choice questions. You need to practice these. You need to listen to the explanations, to the answers, etc. All right, 51. It says identify a metal from table J that is less active than silver. Here we are at table J. The way this table runs for the metals, which silver is a metal, is we are going to go from most active and go down to least active. So let's find silver. If you don't know silver is AG, the symbol, go to reference table S. Here I went ahead and circled silver and I checked off gold, which has the symbol AU. That's going to be our answer. It doesn't matter for question 51 whether you put gold the word or AU the symbol. Move on. Here we are, 51, I'm sorry, 52 through 54 says fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are located in group 17 and are called halogens. In question 52, state in terms of electrons. Now this is important. Anytime you see in terms of, make sure you have electrons in your answer. Why these halogens have similar chemical properties. You might already remember this. That group 17, I cross out the one, and I'm left with the number seven, all have seven valence electrons. If you don't know, the other thing you could do is go to the reference tables and look at fluorine, chlor chlorine, bromine, and iodine on the periodic table and look at the electron configurations and the last number for each one of them is going to be the number seven. Okay, in question 53, we're going to compare the radius of a chlorine atom to a radius of a Cl minus ion. A chloride ion, the reason why you see the dash, it's gained an electron. Just like me, if I eat too much, I gain weight and get bigger. So do nonmetals as they gain electrons. All right, so the chloride ion has a larger size or radius than the chlorine atom. Now, usually this Regis question is always asking about metals and losing electrons and they becoming smaller. For this regions, they did the opposite and asked about the nonmetal gaining electrons and becoming bigger. Now, with my students, I like to use this made up word, MELP, and we always say MELP helps. The M stands for metals, the E for electrons, the L for lose, and the P for positive. So, metals lose electrons and become positively charged. Oh, I forgot the S and smaller. That means the, ha the opposite happens with a non-metal such as chlorine. So MELPS helps. Use it if it helps you. Question 54, it says we're going to draw a Lewis electron dot diagram for an atom of fluorine in the ground state. Fluorine, remember, has seven valence electrons. So what I need to do is I need to set up fluorine fluorine, the symbol F, and then what I need is I need to show seven dots around the fluorine. The dots represent the valence electrons. We put two on each of the sides, but this is six. I need one more, and that makes it seven. So that would be a proper Lewis dot diagram. 
questions 55 through 57 I have my information up here it says a sample of helium gas in a sealed rigid container we're given a temperature of 240k and a pressure of 120 kilopascals and we have an increase in temperature to 360k 55 state the number of significant figures to which the given pressure is expressed. Now you have to realize that kilopascal is a unit of pressure. We have 120 with a decimal point. That decimal point is important because I have a number greater than one in a decimal. We count all three of these numbers in the 120 as significant. So the answer here is three significant figures. For 56, it says determine the pressure of helium at 360K. Well, because we have a sealed rigid container, we can assume that volume remains constant. There is what's known as the combined gas law. You can find it on reference table T. What you want to do is you're going to write it down, plug in the numbers, and calculate the answer. Just went ahead and copied the combined gas law here for you to take a look at. And now we're going to go ahead and substitute the numbers in and calculate an answer. Do things in steps. Don't try to do it all in one step because it's easy to make mistakes. Our initial conditions. Well, first of all, I can cancel volume because volume remains constant. My original pressure is 120 kPa. So I'm going to write 120. I'm going to divide that by our initial temperature of 240. I'm sorry, 120 kilopascals, 240K. On the opposite side, I'm going to put in the temperature as 360 for T2, and I'm going to solve for X. Here is the setup. Okay, in order to solve for X, right, I got to get it alone. I'm going to go ahead, I can cross multiply and then divide. Your answer should be 180. If it is not, make sure you go back and do it. And please make sure you have your calculator and you calculate it for yourself. Okay, so in 56, we're asked to calculate an answer. In 57, they just want a numerical setup. That means we're going to show the work, but we don't have to calculate the answer. I know it sounds crazy, but that's the way the Regents rolls. In this case, we want to know a numerical setup for converting 120 kilopascals to atmospheres. Well, this is just a conversion. Um, I could set up a proportion. I can do it as a conversion factor, whatever you are more comfortable with. But I need to know how many atmospheres is equal to how many kilopascals. That we're going to find on the reference table. So let's go there first. All right, reference table A. Not only does it give us standard pressure in two different units, it gives us standard temperature in two, but this standard pressure, 101.3 kilopascals, is equal to 1 atm. So that, again, I'm going to use that then as my conversion factor. Now, when I deal with Celsius and Kelvin temperature, that has to do with adding or subtracting 273. The equation is on reference table T. For standard pressure, it's just a normal conversion, converting one unit to another by, again, using a proportion. In other words, we're going to multiply and divide. So 1 atm is equal to 101.3 kPa. Again, here it is set up as a proportion. Just make sure your units, right, for what you know to be true, the 1 atm is equal to 101.3 kPa. On the other side, my x is for atm and then 120 kPa or I can set it up as a conversion factor. In other words, take the relationship, right, and set it up so that my KPAs are going to cancel and I'm going to end up with one ATM. For questions 58 and 59, here the first thing I have is a table. I'm looking at aldehydes, meth, eth, prop, but, and pent. So I'm going from one carbon two to three to four to five of an aldehyde, which is a functional group. And then I'm given the molar masses, also referred to as the gram formula masses, how many grams for every one mole of these substances. All right, and then we're given a graph. And always look at the y-axis, we're talking boiling point, and the x, which is molar mass. So you see that there are four points here that have been plotted. Question 58 is asking, based on the graph, determine the boiling point for butanol. So butanol 
is not on the graph. We have the first three and the last one, but we're missing butte now. All right, what I would recommend is let's draw a line and get a best fit line first. And then based on the molar mass for butte now, we can go ahead and figure out where it should be. We'll go up from molar mass, hit the line, and then go over and read the boiling point. All right, so I did with the four points what we call a best fit line. In other words, it's not really connect the dots. I'm just trying to fit the data so you see points on either side. I would recommend if this was your Regents exam, use the edge of the reference table almost as a ruler. And then Butenal is 72.1, so I just kind of guesstimated around 72 through this light blue line and then when it hit the purple line which is our line of best fit to go over and then read off of the y-axis so I would say maybe 350 to 353 or so the answer key always gives the teachers a range so if you're within the accepted range you're fine all right in 59 we need to determine the mass of propanal. So now it's not butanal anymore. They want to know propanal's mass uh, if we have three moles using the molar mass given in the table. The formula that links mass and moles is found on reference table T. Here is the equation from reference table T and here's the substitution. Three moles is equal to X. That's my mass over my gram formula mass of 58.1 from the table. In order to solve for x, all I'm going to do is multiply 3 times 58.1, right, or get x alone. Remember, it's really just a proportion. 3 is equal to 3 over 1. So x times 1 is equal to 3 times 58.1 is 174.3. Or if you put it as 174, you would be fine. Now we're dealing with questions 60 through 62. We have a one milliliter sample of water heated in a flask to a boiling at 1 atm. As the water boils, some of the liquid water changes phase to a water vapor. The equation below represents the change. Okay, question 60, describe the change in potential energy of the water molecules that vaporize during boiling. Well, during boiling, if you recall, when you have a phase change on a heating curve, you have a plateau or a horizontal line. And that is because, in this case, by adding energy, potential energy increases. That's all you'd have to say for question 60, increases. For 61, it says compare the entropy of water as a liquid to water as a gas. Water as a gas has more entropy as water as a liquid. Or you could say water as a liquid has less entropy than water as a gas. Make sure you're specific with what you're talking about to make sure you get the credit. And then finally in 62, determine the mass of liquid water that vaporizes. You got 7,700 joules of energy absorbed by the liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius. Now we're talking vaporizing. We are not at a delta T. It happens, of course, in this case at the boiling point. So I need one of the heat equations. Let's go take a look at reference table T. Pulling down reference table T, here are the second to last group is your heat equations. And we want vaporization. So we're going to go ahead and use Q is equal to MHV. Now, there's one other place you need to look, and that's the front of the reference tables because you need the constant. They have the heat of vaporization and the heat of fusion on the front of the reference tables for water. And here it is. Heat of vaporization on reference table B is 20 to 60 joules per gram. Put the equation here. Q is equal to MHV. And now I'm substituting in. I have 770 joules. That's my Q. And that's equal to M for mass. That's what I'm solving for. And the heat of vaporization for water is 2260. I need to get M alone. I'm going to divide both sides by 2260. So 7700 divided by 2260 is equal to 3.4 grams. That's my answer for 62. Last three questions in part B-2. Tritium, hydrogen 3 is a radio 
isotope. 63, state the number of neutrons in an atom of tritium. All right, well, remember your neutrons and your protons give an atom its mass. And because you see a, a name here for an element and a dash and a number, this three is the mass number. That's the protons and neutrons together. In order to figure out the neutrons, I'm going to subtract the atomic number for hydrogen, which is one, and that's the number of protons. So th literally three minus one is equal to two. And that's our answer for 63. For 64, it says, complete the nuclear equation in your answer booklet for the decay of tritium by writing the notation for the missing nuclide. So let me find the answer booklet, and we'll do that right now. Here we are at the answer booklet. 64 is right here. You'll notice we're dealing with tritium, the 3 and the 1 for the hydrogen. And what we have here is a beta particle. And we want to figure out what goes in the line here or the blank. Well, when you're balancing nuclear equations, you want the numbers on top on either side to equal one another and the numbers on the bottom to equal one another. In other words, three is equal to zero plus what number? So that has to be the number three. And then hydrogen on the bottom, it's one. And one is equal to, on the other side, we have a minus one plus. So what minus one is equal to one, and that is two. So be careful when you have a beta particle. It's called a beta minus particle, and that's because, again, you have a number of minus one. A lot of times, students will get tricked. Don't get tricked. It's just that one is equal to minus one plus two, and of course, that's one. So what element do we identify as element two as far as atomic number? If you don't know, please look it up on the periodic table, but yes, it is helium. Remember, you need the symbol as well. All right, for 65, we're gonna to go to table N. It says, identify a nuclide that has the same decay mode as tritium, but has a longer half-life. So let's do that. Right, so the tritium, I just circled it. Again, has a decay mode of beta or beta minus decay. 12.13 years is the half-life. We want beta decay and more years, and there's gonna be more than one answer on the table. So one possible answer here is carbon-14 because it's the same decay more years. It can't be cobalt because, of course, it's less years, even though it's the same decay. Decay. Same decay, less years. But it can be cesium. 30.2 years is greater than 12.31. Same decay. I think you get the gist. Well, we've done it. We've gone through B-2. Not too bad, I think. Just make sure that you're reading the questions and using your reference table and check out other parts of the test. Keep working hard. Good luck.